John Gilstrap, good morning, Johnny. Good morning. Nice to be here. It's great to have you. It, you know, it's really my pleasure. It's wonderful to have you. <laughs> it couldn't be better. Best thing that's happened to me all day was when you walked through the door and smiled. Well, that doesn't that make Matt feel good? <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey, who this morning was uh, explaining the distinctions between the numbers 599 and 601. Good morning, Matt. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing very well. It's great to have you with us. Are you sure? Would it be nice to say sure? Natalie Clad? Would that be a, an effective way of describing his uh, his attire today? I will tell you it's the first time I would have used the word Natalie in quite some time. Uh, Harvey comes in and he just exudes warmth. Like I feel like there should be a fireplace and a pipe next to, to Matt and a dog. Because he's, well, he's always got, got, the dog. He's got the sweater on, the tie, the jacket. Do you have patches on the elbows? No. Not on this one, but I do have... I know you have some with patches. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, I appreciate your address. I can't believe you're not roasting. In, with, you, you got... You got but the, you're part, the, you're the part wool. polar bear, though, Gilstrap. That's true. You I, are, I, I'm warm-blooded or cold-blooded. I don't know you, what the you right You sleep one. with, like, the windows open in the winter. Literally. Yeah. And, and the heat off. It was it was 56 degrees in my room this morning when I got That's up. That's just too cold. But my job is then to close the window and turn on the heat before my wife gets up. So That just makes things ache on me when it gets to be that cold, man. Uh, big day on the program here as well. We started off with Ryan Thorne, State Director for the USDA Rural Development. Ryan, good morning. How are you? Hey, good morning, Rob. Gentlemen, uh, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on this morning. Our pleasure. I, I know uh, we've done some work at the USDA in the past with uh, Dr. Tracy Lesky when we uh, we track the latest invasive species that's eating our crops around here in the eastern panhandle. And that included the spotter and lanternfly most recently and the stink bug which uh, is still around, but nowhere near as, as a, much of a nuisance as it was, say, maybe 10 years ago uh, or so. Uh, specifically, Ryan, what do you do in your office? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, at USDA, uh, we probably have about a dozen agencies under sort of the, the Department of Agriculture umbrella. But specifically at, at rural development, I always say that uh, we are the community and economic development arm uh, of the department. We are advocates for, investors in, and partners to uh, rural communities and the people, businesses, and organizations within those communities. So are you located in D.C. or are you here in Jefferson County? So we, uh, at, at Rural Development in West Virginia, we have uh, roughly 46 employees across 11 offices throughout the state, uh, including an office in Martinsburg uh, there at the Aiken Center. Okay, you're right around the corner from where we are then, here in Berkeley County. Yeah, yeah. so, so we do work uh, across the state uh, through, our, through our regional and, and our sort of satellite offices. Uh, we're really the, the boots on the ground uh, for the agency when it comes to community development. Now, though Berkeley County is growing, and uh, obviously the city of Martinsburg is the largest municipality in, in Berkeley County, uh, much of this area is still considered very rural, and there are things that folks are eligible for in this community that they may not be aware of. Can you go through some of those programs? Sure. <clears throat> so we have you know, roughly uh, 70 programs uh, at USDA Rural Development. Uh, whenever I was pointed to the position, uh, a little less than two years ago, we, we had, uh, we said over 50, uh, and now we have close to 70. So uh, the program offerings uh, sort of increase over time. Um, we, through our, our, our major uh, sort of mission areas, we have our community programs, which can help with uh, infrastructure, basic infrastructure, water sewer projects, community facilities. Uh, so we can help municipalities uh, enhance their public safety through the uh, acquisition of police cars, um, other sort of public safety equipment. Uh, we can help libraries, um, you know, hospitals, uh, basically uh, anything that provides a public service we can support through our community programs. We have housing programs. Uh, we provide direct loans or mortgages to individuals that may not otherwise qualify uh, through a, uh, another source, uh, home repair programs, through our housing programs. Uh, we, we offer um, business programs that support uh, organizations that then support entrepreneurship and small businesses or directly support uh, small businesses through grant programs, which I think I can talk to you a little bit more about uh, in, in sort of the uh, it's a natural, National Entrepreneurship Week uh, this week, so happy to, to go over a few of those with you. And we also offer programs such as our, our Reconnect broadband program, which helps 
um, deploy and expand access to high-speed Internet throughout the state. Now, those are all good programs, and you mentioned a couple you wanted to expand upon. Uh, if you could, go right ahead into that, uh, if you don't mind, Ryan. Sure, sure. So the first one uh, that I'd like to talk to about is our Rural Business Development Grant Program, or RPDG. Uh, so this program, uh, it's it's pretty broad in, in scope uh, for eligible for what an eligible project may be. If it uh, helps spur economic community development, uh, workforce development, job creation, more than likely a project would be eligible under this program. Who would be the applicants? They would be uh, local nonprofits, your economic development authorities, uh, colleges, universities, community colleges, and then also towns could apply themselves. Uh, and so this program, uh, applications are due at the end of the month. It's an annual cycle. Uh, we can provide roughly, you know, fifty to $100,000 in grant funding to support those projects that I, I mentioned earlier can support uh, economic and workforce development. So that's one of probably our, our most popular programs uh, when it comes to sort of the, the business side of things. We, we, we receive anywhere from 25, 30 applications. Uh, and we give out roughly six or seven hundred thousand in grants uh, through that program every year. Are these all uh, a couple of uh, Brian? Are oh, these sorry, all federal but, grants, or are some of them a mix of state and federal? Uh, these are federal grants, but a lot of times uh, the applicants they'll have support from other state agents, let's say a state agency, another federal agency, uh, pr a private philanthropic organization, a community foundation. Uh, so a lot of projects, you know, sort of like the patchwork, patchwork quilt of, of funding. Uh, you know, a lot of these projects are funded from more than one source. John Gilstrap, <clears throat> trying to get an idea of the, the scope of these things. If there's an entrepreneur who's just starting his, his business, starting his plumbing shop or, you know, whatever his, his work is, is he eligible? Is that that person, that entrepreneur eligible for these grants as well? You mentioned nonprofits as which is kind of counterintuitive to me in, in terms of who gets the the money to for job growth uh, funding. Yes, that's a that's a great question. So on our rural business development grant program, for profit businesses actually are not eligible under this program, but organizations that then in turn support small businesses and entrepreneurs um, are eligible. So for example, um, let's say the uh, the, the Berkeley County Economic Development Authority <clears throat> wanted to launch a program uh, that would help small businesses uh, with their online marketing, um, sort of uh, training in that aspect. They could apply for a grant through uh, USDARD uh, to, in turn, be able to provide those services to those small businesses and entrepreneurs uh, in the county. Um, so that's sort of the uh, the way that RBDG works. Uh, but we do have in you know, a lot of folks say, oh, there's there's all these these grants for small businesses, federal grants for small businesses. That's that's kind of uh, not not necessarily always true. It, it's sort of like the white elephant, uh, you know, um, where there's grants specifically for for-profit small businesses, and we actually have two uh, where small businesses are indeed eligible, and they're the only uh, entities eligible. And um, I can go into a couple of those uh, with you. Yeah, All right. please go right ahead. So the first is our value-added producer grant program, uh, and that's sort of just as it sounds. We help uh, ag producers, small farmers, help develop um, value-added products from, let's say, what they grow. Uh, so you have, uh, let's say, a, a beef a beef farmer. Uh, he wants to take his beef uh, and, let's say, uh, start a beef jerky company to supply local restaurant, uh, local grocery stores, gas stations, convenience stores with that product. We could help that beef farmer um, with a grant to be able to develop uh, packaging, uh, acquire uh, some non-fixed assets like, uh, let's say, a commercial dehydrator uh, and some other uh, things and able to get that beef farmer uh, to be able to produce that beef jerky, get it to market, have another product, uh, enhance his income, things of that nature. Another example would be someone that, let's say, uh, is a big tomato grower, and everybody in the community says, man, uh, you know, Miss White, who grows those tomatoes, she makes excellent salsa. I wish she would bottle that and sell it. Well, the value-added producer grant program could potentially help uh, that individual 
uh, with that business plan to make that salsa to be able to distribute it out there to those stores in a retail fashion. Uh, and so that is a, a sort of a one-to-one match program. If they would come to us and ask for 100000 they would in turn need to put $100,000 sort of skin in the game in order to get that grant. Dude, you're making me so hungry this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Jerky, jerky and salsa. Jerky, you know, they, salsa. they go together well. You throw bacon in there, yeah. and I'm leaving right now. I'll be going to the, rest, to the restaurant. Ryan <laughs> Thorne is our guest here on the program. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Harvey. Good morning, Ryan. Um, if someone's listening and they live in a is, and they live in an area that has population, or how do they know if they're in a populated area or a rural area, and if there's a and if it matters where you live as far as any place in West Virginia. So I tell you, this, that is a that is sometimes a, a very interesting um, uh, way to look at things. Uh, so under our business programs, uh, if a community has a population of fifty thousand or less, so with the updated census data, uh, we we implemented the twenty twenty census data at the beginning of this fiscal year. Uh, so under our new data set, um, any program in our business side of programs, uh, any area with a population of less than 50,000 would be eligible. So that includes all of West Virginia now. So uh, basically, if you live in an area uh, in West Virginia, you'd be eligible under our business programs. On the other side of things, under our community programs, um, the sort of the population is 10,000 and less or 25,000 and less. It really varies by sort of the program area. Okay, so the community is not defined as the county. It's defined as the local municipality. Yeah, it's uh, and it depends what program uh, under right. under uh, RD, but yeah, it's it's basically uh, it could be the municipality, the county, based on the program, or it could even just be a census tract, a magisterial district, or a service area. <laughs> and so it, it it gets confusing at times, and I'm I'm sure the folks at our regional planning and development councils and all those that wa- work on water sewer projects they're they're well aware of sort of those, um, but on our business programs. It's uh, if it's an area, a town, or a, uh, it's a basically a, a location. So if you're in a city and you want to do that work in the city, it's the population of that city. But the good thing in West Virginia, under our business programs, we don't have to worry about that because the whole state's eligible. Is there any special initiatives or areas of focus that the USDA is undertaking right now? Yeah, so I'd say, uh, uh, you know, food security. Um, that's that's incredibly important, and so we saw that through the the pandemic how how important our sort of local food um, supply chain is, uh, how how important it is to have uh, food security locally. So I think some of these programs can help with that. Um, we also offer a, a BNI a loan guarantee program, uh, which can help startup businesses acquire uh, private funding loans. We basically mitigate the risk to the bank. Uh, and then also one, one area um, is our Rural Energy for America program, uh, or REAP. Uh, this is another one of those programs where small businesses are eligible to apply directly. And actually, it's only eligible to for-profit small businesses. But our, but our Rural Energy for America program, it's sort of there's two tracks. There's a renewable energy track and an energy efficiency track. And so on the renewable energy track, let's say a, a small business, it, as long as they meet the definition of small business by SBA standards, they comply for this program. So anything from a, a dentist office to, let's say, a, a warehousing company uh, to a, a small fabrication shop, they could be eligible to, let's say they wanted to put a solar uh, on the roof of their business. They could come to us, apply under REAP, and they could get, uh, we could help them with up to 50% of that project cost up to a million dollars. So let's say a, a dentist's office wants to put solar on the rooftop of their office building. Um, let's say it costs 300000 We could potentially come in and provide a $150,000 grant uh, to that, that business uh, to, to place that solar project. And that's the renewable track. And then there's the energy efficiency track um, under REAP. And so let's say uh, that warehousing company Let's say that warehouse was built 60 years ago. Um, we can come in, help upgrade the L- with LED, energy-efficient lighting, uh, new insulation, doors, HVAC systems, basically anything that could save that, um, that warehouse on uh, energy costs. We'd come in, we could help fund through a grant 50% of the 
project cost up to $500,000. So, I mean, a businesses, you know, they don't want to leave this money on the table if they're looking to do that sort of work. So do do in order to qualify for the that particular grant, for example, is is it first come first serve? All else being equal, if everyone has the same bank accounts, if you've got twenty five businesses that are all lined up to do this, do all twenty five get it? How does how is that decision made? Sure. So we do, um, and under the Reflation, Inflation Reduction Act, we did receive uh, quite a significant increase in funding through our REAP program. Uh, traditionally, we had maybe a million dollars uh, per year. Uh, to award out to applicants. Now we have over a million dollars per quarter. Uh, it's a quarterly cycle now under REAP that we're able to, to grant out to awardees. And so there is sort of a scoring matrix um, associated with REAP. Um, it's based on a number of, of, number of items, but specifically um, how much energy or you know, energy costs that can potentially save that small business. And so the higher the savings, the higher the, the project would score. Um, so do we, I'm sorry, go ahead. So we, with the increase in funding through the Inflation Reduction Act, I don't think we've had to turn away one eligible project yet this year, um, which, is a, which is a great thing. So it, in, in terms of the judgment of, of the allocation of funds, are there set-asides, like, for example, to do – uh, veterans or minorities get special uh, consideration in these, or is it strictly based on, on the need of the company? Yeah, that's a, that is a great question under this program. I know there, there are a few of our programs, like our, 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 our BDG program, uh, where under the scoring matrix there, um, they end under our VAPG program that minority business owners, uh, disadvantaged dis, uh, business owners, do receive um, sort of uh, priority points, if you will, uh, in the scoring matrix there. So I would have to look to see if that's the same case with REAP. Um, but I know through a few of our other programs, that is the case. And where is that decision made? Is that a Washington decision or is that your office? Uh, the programs that I mentioned uh, this morning, those are all state uh, state managed programs. So those decisions are made by the state team here in West Virginia. Ryan Thornton is our guest. He's the USDA State Director here in uh, West Virginia for Rural Development. Uh, Ryan, you mentioned water and sewer. Is uh, well and septic included in that? So we do have uh, sort of a, a program at Rural Development that can help with sort of those non-public um, individual, and I, I can't remember the term, uh, but there is a program that can help support a small, uh, you know, a, a, a resident uh, with uh, individual well and, and septic service. Um, and we'd be happy to, to work with that individual. They would just need to give our one of our office, one of our 11 offices a call. That would seem to go hand in hand with rural development. I would suspect that if we surveyed, most folks in rural areas don't have water and sewer, they have more well and septic. Uh, so I'll describe a scenario to me and you tell me if your office would have been able to help in this situation. So a friend of mine purchased a place with uh, you know, my well and septic and didn't know there were some issues with the well and septic until some time went by, a lot of rain came, and uh, they found out that uh, they needed to have a major repair uh, for the well and septic because of where it was situated as, a, as compared to the lay of the land, the elevation, and how the water gathers when there's a ton of rain, right? So this was a, a costly major repair uh, that these folks were not prepared to make. So is a situation like that one in which had they contacted you, there would have been some assistance? That is a, that is a great scenario. Um, that, that one is a tough to, tough to say yes on, uh, tough to say no on. Um, you know, we would have to take – it would all vary, you know, depending on the, uh, the individual's income level, uh, also their age, uh, because we do have a program that can help sort of seniors, 65 and 62 and older, uh, that are considered low income. We do have a home repair program uh, where it can help with septic and well. Uh, it's, it's a grant and loan program. Um, so uh, tough to make a determination on that specifically. Uh, but if there's any question, um, you know, feel free to, if anybody has a situation like that, have them give us a call. Um, if we can't help, 
we may be able to direct them to a resource that could help with that situation. Fair enough. Uh, let's get into the mortgage program a moment, if you could, because you mentioned home loans as well. Who would qualify for that? What are the parameters? You know, I think it's uh, it's it's based off uh, uh, income uh, for the, the household, and it varies by county. Uh, and so I, I did not uh, check to see sort of what Jefferson or Berkeley County's income limits were, uh, but um, that is a determination. Usually uh, a credit score of, let's say, 640, 660 um, would be needed, uh, a good, solid um, history of making payments. Uh, but uh, we, we can help a lot of individuals uh, that may not qualify through the traditional route. Um, you know, let's say they might have ran into uh, some hard times, missed a few payments uh, a year or so ago, and that may be something that a traditional bank may not take a look at, uh, may not uh, qualify them for a mortgage. Uh, and so we have our 502 Direct, which is our direct home loan program, and we also do home loan guarantees. So an individual would find a, a lender, a participating lender, uh, and then we would provide a, a guarantee to that lender to help mitigate the risk for that lender to make that mortgage. Stacy Burkett in our Facebook comment section said they also lend to developers who want to build affordable housing. Can you address that? Sure. So that is through our multifamily housing program, and those are um, actually not managed under the states uh, anymore. A couple years ago, uh, that was sort of uh, – uh, became a regional uh, sort of program. But through our multifamily housing programs, we can help developers uh, with uh, low interest, long-term uh, financing options to build a, a sort of affordable housing complexes, multi-unit complexes um, in areas of need. Ryan, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about this stuff. And I'm, I think of the, the depth and breadth of these programs and wondering how on earth do people find about find out about this good question so we uh we work with a lot of community stakeholders um you know we we have good relationships with a lot of local banks uh county commissions our regional planning and development councils economic development authorities um hopefully if, if they don't if they aren't aware of our programs uh we're not doing our, our job well enough uh but like I said, we have 70 programs, so it's tough to, to keep a, keep an eye on all of those. Uh, folks, if they want to learn more, they can visit our website. It's rd.usda.gov, um, or they can give us a call if they have any questions about any of our programs at 304-284-4871. Um, and on our website, it lists our 11 offices. Uh, feel free to stop by one of our uh, offices throughout the state, and as I mentioned, we have one there in the Aiken Center uh, in Martinsburg. So if somebody already has an SBA loan, say, or, or participating in a different federal uh, program, can they also qualify for this? Can we double and triple dip on on programs like this? Uh, it would vary. Um, a lot of times we, uh, we can uh, let's say with the Appalachian Regional Commission, we can combine our resources with theirs to fund a specific project. Uh, but a lot of times, uh, federal agencies, if it's one project, let's say, a lot of times there's a cap of, let's say, 80 percent, that uh, only 80 um, percent of that project can be funded by federal dollars. And that's through any agency. It's where, let's say, the other 20 percent would need to be funded by either the applicant themselves, a state agency, a foundation, uh, or otherwise. But let's say it's two completely different projects that one organization is working on, uh, then they could potentially be funded by, let's say, Small Business Administration, uh, Rural Development, uh, or any other federal agency. It really varies. Uh, um, and, you know, it's, it's tough to ju juggle all these things. Uh, I know it, it, it's tough for sort of the stakeholders out there. Uh, but if there's any questions, they can give us a call. Uh, but I, I can't imagine that uh, if it's varying projects that uh, receiving some sort of federal grant a year ago from a different agency for a different program or project would disqualify that individual from coming to us for assistance. Ryan, do you work with Kent Leonhardt, the state's ag commissioner, in any capacity? Sure. I, I know the, the commissioner. Uh, we, we partner with the West Virginia Department of Agriculture on a, on a number of items specifically outreach and promotion 
uh, of our programs and some sort of their programs just to see how we can provide opportunities for those those, those farmers and uh, small ag producers across the state. Uh, but they have a he has a good team, especially on the business development side, with the Department of Agriculture. So we do work with uh, Commissioner Leonhardt, uh, my colleague John Perdue at the um, Farm Service Agency within um, USDA. Uh, we we all work together. I, I always say community and economic development. Uh, it's a it's a team sport. Uh, so when we all work together, we can do more. We can do a lot more together. Very nice, uh, Ryan. Do you stay in position regardless of what party is in power in Washington D.C.? <laughs> uh, great question. Um, I uh, I am uh, appointed by the White House, uh, and so um, um, I would say uh, uh, <laughs> no. I I would uh, change uh, if an administration were to change. Oh, you guys, uh, it's a tough way to go through life. You always have to have the moving company's number with you, right? Right. Yeah, that's a that's a weird uh, thing to all be, be political too. Yeah, it's an, it's it's an inter- interesting uh, how that works as a political appointee. So, uh, Ryan, I appreciate your time this morning. Uh, if you could once again review how people can get in touch with you and find out more about the programs that we've discussed this morning. Sure, they can visit our website at rd.usda.gov. Uh, give our office a call at three zero four. Two eight four forty eight seventy one, 484 or visit one of uh, our 11 offices uh, across the state. And uh, what's your Super Bowl pick this weekend, Ryan? Uh, I'm going with the 49ers. Uh, oh. I think it's just time for uh, for another team to, to win the Super Bowl. Do you have Taylor Swift fatigue? <laughs> <laughs> I am in, definitely in my fatigue era. Yeah. <laughs> must have kids. Hey, Ryan, thanks, man. I appreciate your time this morning. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Anytime. Absolutely. Thanks, sir. Uh, thanks to care. Andrew Stacy for setting up that interview with us, uh, with uh, Ryan there this morning. So, th- Andrew, thanks for reaching out and uh, making that happen there.